This Jody here with another video for biology, apologetics. So uh, we have our finishing of chapter, what chapter was that? 15 on Kingdom Plantae. And now we get to move on to Kingdom Animalia. So we're finally there. Um, and this is really the end of a regular biology course. Uh, you would end uh, studying Kingdom Animalia and then maybe the, you know, ecology side of it or whatever, but we already studied ecology way back in chapter three. Um, but Kingdom Animalia would be the end of it. Now our book will go on past Kingdom Animalia and pretty much do a whole unit on human anatomy and physiology looking specifically at the humans um, in this Kingdom Animalia category. So, um, with us being a little bit behind, we'll see how far we get, but I see that this book is pretty intense and there's a lot. So, um, trying to accomplish it all in this one year, we'll do what we can, but at least we will have gotten to the end of a regular biology course where you would study it all the way through Kingdom Animalia. So, with Kingdom Animalia, we're going to look at the characteristics of that kingdom. And then we will um, move through it, looking at the less complex creatures and looking at the invertebrates and move our way up to um, the bigger creatures. Now, the sad part is that as we're doing this, and of course, as a reminder, these are just little videos on notes. And so that way we can get our notes done while we're separated. Um, and don't forget to be putting your notes on a half sheet of paper so we can glue them in. Uh, where I'm gonna keep the journals going and um, any diagrams, keep those with your um, half sheets and then we'll glue them in um, so we can finish out our journals. But the sad part is during this time, once we get into King Manimalia, that's where we could do all of our dissections. And so you get to really see the anatomy of these particular living organisms and, and how amazing all the parts and the irreducible complexity of it all. So, um, but being stuck at home is going to be a little harder because we have to study all this and then we have to come together whenever we're allowed to get back together once everything settles down and do a lot of dissections. So um, don't be skipping out when we're able to come back together. Don't be skipping out a class because you're going to be doing a lot of dissections. Um, it's something that's real important to biology and helps us get a better understanding of the, inter the insides, the in internal anatomy of the living organisms. All right, so um, kingdom animalia. So what we do anytime we start a new kingdom is to look at the characteristics. Because like we've talked before, and we're getting these uh, living organisms. When we started at the beginning of the year, we said, okay, what does it mean to be alive, first of all? Okay, so you got to have meet these certain characteristics to be considered alive. And then once you're considered alive, then we start putting you in categories so we can keep track of all these living organisms. And that's a study of biology. There's just so many living organisms. If you didn't start putting them in categories, you couldn't keep track of it all. And so we had the, are you alive? And then if you are, okay, what type of cell do you uh, have? And then that will determine from that point on, then uh, what kingdom shall we put you in? And we have the division of the kingdoms. And then we went on to the um, lower classifications, lower down the scale and smaller boxes as I would say. So the first thing we have to look at is if we're going to look at Kingdom Animalia, one of the main kingdoms, we have to figure out what makes, what characteristics um, do you have to have to get in this kingdom. So some of the characteristics of animals will be um, one, eukaryotic cells, which we already know because we're at this point past um, when we were studying the uh, prokaryotes, and then we moved on, remember, to the eukaryotes, and we started from uh, Chromista and Protozoa on in fungi, and then now uh, in plantae, and then Kingdom Animalia. So the bigger we get and the more complex, and we're in that eukaryotic group. So the eukaryotic cell, um, the Kingdom Animalia, is filled with um, all these heterotrophic creatures. So if you remember when we studied this, heterotrophic versus autotrophic, Hetero. Hetero means different. Trophic is how you get your food. Okay, so if we um, are heterotrophic, that means we have to, we can't make it ourselves. If we could make food ourselves, we'd be autotrophic. We automatically get our food ourselves. But when it comes to a heterotroph, or heterotrophic organism, you've got to, maintain, you've got to get food from another source. And so um, 
eukaryotic, heterotrophic, and multicellular. And we remember the difference between whether you being unicellular, whether you could colonize, and then also whether you could be multicellular. And so with this um, eukaryotic, heterotrophic, and multicellular. And then also with the characteristics of animals, we have what we um, see in Kingdom Animalia is that animals will have a structure system. They have a way because um, in Kingdom Plantae, the cell walls, um, we, along with the water that is um, in the vacuoles, create that trigger pressure to keep the, the um, cells uh, in the plant stiff. And so they have a structure system with their cell walls where we need a structure system to keep our cells where they need to be and such. And so that's the skeletal world. So in the skeletal world, you can of course have an endoskeleton, you can have an exoskeleton, you can have a hydroskeleton. So the endoskeleton, I always think of in, inside, a skeleton inside. Exoskeleton, I always think of an outside exited skeleton, like in the arthropods and bugs and such. Um, hydroskeleton would be things like the jellies, how they have the water that's in the, um, the center that pushes out and creates a hydrostatic type skeleton. Um, so they have a structure system. And then they also have, as one of their main things, collagen. And if we looked at the kingdom plantae, remember cellulose was a big thing in kingdom plantae. Well, when it comes to animals, one big thing is that we see collagen is a very important part of the kingdom animalia. Scologen, or collagen helps us with uh, skin, our muscles, our bones, connective tissue. Um, and then also there's a body plan in characteristics of animals. So animals have a body plan and they might be what we call bilateral. And this would be when bi meaning two, we have kind of two sides like we are. You can split us down the middle, down our nose and, and externally we have a bilateral system, not internally. Um, uh, radial, this would be like a body plan where we would have something like a sea star where it radiates out in all directions or whatever. There's more of a radial sense. Um, and then there's also a uh, asymmetrical, there we go. Uh, and I didn't write one for that, but uh, let's see, like a crab. So a crab has some things where it's on both sides, but then you know you have the one big um, part of the crab's arm. Uh, so that would be, they give that example in our book. So a a symmetrical, where A means not, so you don't have a good symmetrical body plan, but it's still considered a body plan because it's still a way that the body has come together. And so these are some of the characteristics of animals that you'll see in the beginning of the chapter, um, introducing Kingdom Animalia. So with Kingdom Animalia, um, we have the characteristics of the animals, how you're gonna get in that category and what we're gonna see in that category. And then we also have the classification of animals. And you know, we've been studying classification for a while, so you know how this works. Um, Dear King Philip came over for good spaghetti, your domain, your kingdom, your phylum, class, your order, your family, your genus, and the species. And remember the naming is the binomial nomenclature of genus and species. So we're still gonna use our system for classification to get everybody into smaller boxes so we can keep everything orderly. Um, and some of the things that we can use for classification and figuring out which animals go with which animals and how we put who where, um, we can do things like um, the difference between invertebrates and vertebrates. So in Kingdom Animalia, that's one of the big things we see a, a division with the invertebrates being the ones that do not have a backbone and then the ones that have a backbone, the vertebrates, vertebrae, right? And if you put in in front of this word, it means not vertebrae. So we can separate them that way. And that's what we'll start with when we start going through the categories. We'll start with the invertebrates and then we'll move up to the vertebrates. And then you could look at things like um, how they regulate their body temperature for the process of trying to keep everything stable, what we call homostasis. And so um, they might be endothermic. So creatures that are endothermic, I always circle the N, E-N, just to remember that they can regulate their body temperature inside their own body. We are endothermic creatures. Um, ectothermic, which I always accidentally put an X there. As you see, I've erased it because I always do that. I always say exothermic. Um, but ectothermic, which I think of the word ek, or the letters ek, and makes kind of like the X sound. So I can think of exiting. So in the sense, an ectothermic creature is going to need an, a source from the outside to heat, to add that extra heat that's necessary to maintain that, that balance.
we call homeostasis. So um, you might be an endothermic creature or you might be looking at an ectothermic creature. And so that's another way we could start to sort of separate them. Okay, um, and then there's also another way we can look at the creatures, what we call germ layers. And so germ layers, um, they're basically the germ, they're what's developing in the embryo. So most animals have germ layers, typically like three, but some have only two. And the germ layers, um, I wrote them out, but I, I'm giving you a diagram to give you a little better understanding. Um, but we have the layers, the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. And so as the embryo is developing, then you have these layers of cells being made that will eventually turn into um, things in the living organism. Like our book says, the endoderm will eventually turn into the digestive tract, but really the endoderm turns into way more. I'll show you on the, um, the diagram. But the mesoderm, things like the muscle, the circulatory system, other systems. Um, the ectoderm is the outer layer covering and um, related systems that go along with the outer covering. And if I move right over here to the diagram, this is one of the diagram pages I'm sending you. Now remember, I send it to you in one page. And when it's one page, it's really two sheets. It, well, you cut it in half. If you fold it in half exactly and cut it down the middle, it becomes two of the half sheets. Now the first one is the germ layers here, but then the second one will go with the next video. Um, that way we don't waste paper um, when we start looking at the invertebrates and we start looking at the sponges and the nigerians and all those. Okay, so that is the start of um, that chapter. But I just, since I, I sent it in one PDF, I don't want to waste you inking out or uh, uh, one piece of paper there. So I put both diagrams in. But for this video, this is the only one that you need. So um, with these germ layers, let's see if I can get some markers here to create some colors here. Um, originally, so if you think about the beginning of an organism, okay, so at the top of this diagram, we got the zygote here, and we talk about the growth, and we have the um, stages, and we've learned all this when we were looking at the processes of um, reproduction, all those sorts of things, and all the in the beginning of the year, we had all these processes. Um, the eight cell stage here, and then the beginning of more cells and more cells creates the bastula, okay? So the bastula is kind of like this little hollow donut thing that's starting to develop as you're growing into you or whatever creature we're creating here. And so as it begins to, um, the cells begin to duplicate and all the cells begin to, uh, I should say, differentiate. Oh, there goes my pronunciation, right? Um, we begin to have these different layers begin to form. And here, this little bump up which we call, so this would be the bastula, and then this bump up begins to create, this is the blast, uh, blastopore, so there's a, these pores that are gonna help with the, um, the uh, uh, what's it called, the, the making of the layers, I guess. So what happens is the cells in the walls of this bastula begin to move into the inside of the ball. And then when they begin to move in the inside of the ball through a hole called the bastula pore, um, as a result, this inward movement, layers of cells begin to develop and create into these germ layers. So it kind of moves towards the middle and then it creates these layers. So in the end we have, uh, if you are an animal that has produces three germ layers where everything is gonna come out of, you have the endoderm. And again, this is just you, this, this little guy here. You haven't become anything else yet. And then you got, or maybe in my diagram I should say my sea urchin <laughs> because we could start this guy and then make his layers and then turn him into that. Um, the second layer here that's forming and that's the mesoderm and then the third layer, how about I do this, this ectoderm here. So like from the inside out this it's funny because the endoderm when you look at the um, the endoderm, you're thinking, oh, there's a there's a hole in the middle, and that eventually becomes, as you've seen from the the layers, that ends up becoming your digestive tract, the hole through you, that um, everything else is developing around, so that we can get food in and food out. So that will include the entrance, eventually, of the hole, um, which will be your mouth and all that, and then the exit hatch, as we call it, um, the ending part, the anus, that everything will go out. 
So, but when you're just a little guy right here, you're gonna be starting to develop these um, germ layers. Now on this diagram, it's kind of blurry, but it at least gets the point. It's gonna show us in the endoderm. So in the endoderm, that um, first layer, I think I created yellow, the endoderm, what's all gonna be coming out of that. So you can see lung cells, uh, what else does that say? Can't, I can't read it underneath there, but the thyroid cells, the digestive cells. So in our book, it just gave us the digestive cells and didn't give us a lot that would come out of the um, endoderm. And then we have the mesioderm, which is this one I made yellow. And again, blurry, but cardiac muscle cells, skeletal muscles, tube cells, um, tubule cells of the kidney, the red blood cells, smooth muscle cells, all that's going to come out of that developing layer. And then the last layer would be the um, ectoderm, which I made pink here. And that would be skin cells of the epidermis, neurons on the brain, pigment cells, all of those things are linked to that those uh, three that particular layer. So it's kind of cool because when you think then um, as everything's developing and these layers are being made, um, then the full creature eventually in these developmental stages from an 80, no 60 cell, um, little guy here to a gastrula and that is this process of getting the the um, the the way the bastula folds determines like the mouth and then eventually the end the exit hatch that's the process that's called gastrulation which makes sense gastral intestinal um, system like our digestive tract and all that um, so that particular middle layer there um, creating that and so as we are just a little guy like 60 cells here and then we go to the gastrol stage and then then you begin the forearm larvae this is creating an adult sea urchin obviously not to scale um, and then the eight arm larvae and then eventually you got the whole little guy there and so our processes of growth and development are amazing and they all come from that beginning um, part and so it's so fascinating how life is so complex and it can do it can go from this one part like we've learned with the different cells and being able to form and differentiate into others and wow like in the end you have all these complex living organisms so that's the germ cell world I'm sorry not germ cell germ um, layer world so that's something that we can talk about when it comes to classification of animals, because when we look at them, we're a lot of times looking at the structure, and that's part of the structure of the animals. And so like some animals, like they give in here in our book, some like the sea sponges, okay, they don't have any germ layers, they don't have um, the main ones, they, they're asymmet uh, asymmetrical. Um, and say, but a jellyfish, or what we should call jellies because they're not true fish, or like a sea anema, uh, enemy, oh, man, my pronunciation, um, have only two of those germ layers, and they have a different uh, symmetry, like radial. And so as you go along, you can look at the structure of the animal to also help you with your classification. So again, we've got um, whether they're vertebrates, whether they're invertebrates, um, how they regulate the body temperature, the different layers for their structure. Cephalization, this is when um, we see in, in animals when a lot of things are concentrated together um, in what would we would normally call like a head or an area where the sensory organs, the nerve cells, and the mouth kind of all um, joined together. So a lot of times in bilateral symmetry like us, animals tend to have all their sensory organs and their mouth and the concert, uh, concentration of sensory and nerve cells and all that in one area. So cephalization, um, we can look at that and whether or, uh, living organisms have that. Now if we look at a sponge, no, no cephalization. But as the as we look at more complex creatures like a mollusk, you know, which are going to be the clams, the snails, the octopus, the squid, yes, they're going to end up having a certain concentrated area where their sensory organs, their nerves, their brain, all that kind of stuff, if they have that, um, or, or their control system and their mouth are all kind of in one area. So if you look at us, we've got our, our brain, we got our nerve cells, we got our sens sensory organs, our nose to sniff, our mouth to, to taste, our ears to hear, they're all kind of in one area. And so we exhibit cephalization.
as an organism. And so um, then we also have how we have this reproduction thing going on with our living um, organisms in Kingdom Animalia. So reproduction, we've been studying that a lot and we know how that works. And each one of the animals will have to look at their specific means of reproduction. But when it comes to reproduction, we can have external reproduction, or I, I should say external fertilization or internal fertilization. And so as it's fertilized, sometimes it can be fertilized in water. We talked about that before. We'll see some of these depending on um, fish, um, some of the amphibians. We'll see some of this different ways of fertilization. And then we'll also look at um, how do they have their babies? Um, if you are oviparous, you are an organism that's going to be an egg layer. And what I normally do, um, I and it could be soft jelly eggs or it could be hard eggs or whatever, but I usually circle this O for oviparous to remember it like an egg. And then you can, so you can be an egg layer type, or you can be ovoviviparous. So ovo and then viviparous is when you're going to have an, a, a way of having your baby inside you, but the baby's not attached to you. So a lot of creatures that have, are ovoviviparous, they will have, it will look like they're giving live birth, but it's really because um, in a sense, like the regular, what we think of the viviparous creatures, but it's more that the baby's inside, sometimes an oviduct, like a little pouch kind of thing that's inside their body where the eggs are um, kept warm, but the eggs aren't really attached to the mom. Um, and so the difference would be that versus viviparous. And viviparous will be actually when the baby is inside and it's actually attached to the mother, like what we have with our umbilical cord and the placenta and that it's, the baby's nourished from the mother. And so that's a difference between egg layers or egg makers or um, eggs inside of oviducts or whatever and versus the viviparous. Um, and then the last thing would be behavior. So when we look at our kingdom animalia and we're trying to get them all in order and we're trying to figure them all out, we're also going to be looking at behavior. Different animals will exhibit different behaviors, some that are learned and some that are instinctual. And so we'll look as we go through each category, looking at these specifics here for kingdom animalia.